Uh, I'm Eddie Trunk from Sirius XM Radio, and uh, it's great to be here at South by Southwest. I'd like to introduce the panel to you. Uh, first out is a friend of mine for more than 30 years. He's the original lead singer in Skid Row, has a great solo career, and is also an actor and the biggest rock fan you'll ever find. My friend Sebastian Bach is here, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> and uh, Sebastian brought his Black Sabbath records here because he wanted to get them signed get them. by the guy that's about to come out right now. He is, uh, he is a founding member of the creators of heavy metal, ladies and gentlemen, and of course their bassist and lyricist. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Geezer Butler. <laughs> Don't look. <laughs> and uh, last but not least, the woman that brought us all here and is, uh, uh, she was the manager and wife of the late, great Ronnie James Dio, which is why we are all here. We were attending the film, the uh, documentary on Dio, which premiered here yesterday, which we'll talk about a little bit. Um, a dear friend, and she's done amazing work since Ronnie has passed away with the Dio Cancer Fund. Please welcome Wendy Dio. Whoa, whoa. I'm a, I swear I only had coffee. It's too early for anything else. Hi, everyone. So, um, I think what, I know that this panel is supposed to be a conversation about the genre of metal music in general, but before we get into that, I think we should talk a little bit about what brought us here, which is the film that we all had a chance to see for the first time on Ronnie James Dio, which there will be a release date somewhere down the line, but anybody that had a chance to see it uh, has been floored, including the four of us. Starting with you, Wendy, can you talk a little bit about how this film came together, where the idea came from? and well, we've been working on it for like about three years. Um, BMG uh, sent a, a bunch of people, different people, directors, and um, there wasn't the right one. And then Don and Demian came along, and they were just they were just dear fans. They knew all about his history, and it was really easy to work with. And we really enjoyed working together with them. And we found a lot of stuff from old archives, and uh, we just uh, it was just wonderful. And Terry and Sebastian were both in in it with Rob Halford and Lita Ford, and of course Eddie. And it was a, it was it was a, it was a long journey. Uh, there's lots of fun in it, lots of laughter, and a lot of emotional uh, parts in it, too. I, I, I think everyone needs to take tissues with them when they see it. Yeah. Um, and Wendy's referring to Don Argot and Demian Fent uh, Fenton, who directed it and did a brilliant job, and they're here somewhere as well. And I know they put years into mm -hmm. uh, getting it together. And uh, as I said, I, I'm so happy because Ronnie deserves a document like this that even when we're all gone, people can look back and see the type of person he was and the amazing music contributions he made. Geezer, for you, having been a, a bandmate with Ronnie and, of course, uh, doing three, four incredible Sabbath studio records and, and all of that, how did it feel for you to, to watch the film? Uh, I thought it was really good. It really brought what Ronnie was all about, his personality. And, and I must admit, I shed a few tears towards the end because it was got so emotional. Um, I, I thought it was a great documentary. I really did. Some of the whole, from his, where he was born right until, up until the end. And do you feel that it accurately portrayed his contributions to Sabbath in that period and the ups and downs of that period? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I mean, you could have gone on forever about the ups right. and downs. But. <laughs> no, I could have taken my documentary just on that, of course. But, yeah. uh, of course. Um, but yeah, I'm so glad that we finished, all finished as friends. Yeah, yeah. That was the main thing for us. Yeah, absolutely. And Sebastian, I mean, you and I sat next, next to each other and watched it and we're nudging each other and we're crying and hugging. And, um, but you being such a fan of Ronnie and also, of course, having known him, yeah. what were your reactions to the film? 
Well, um, I, as I said in the film, it always astonishes me to realize that Ronnie put out his first music in the 50s, before the Beatles. Uh, Ronnie and the Prophets and the Red Caps. And so to see that part of his childhood and how he started, even before the Rolling Stones, and you know, he's been doing it a long time, and then he fits so much into his life, so many different projects, careers, and then, it, at the, as Geezer said at the end, it's very sad because, you know, I, he, he's not with us anymore. And, and, and it just, for me, it just is a movie that kind of shows how short life is. Like, you can pack as much as you can into your life, and, um, and then it, you still have to say goodbye someday. So it was very sad at the end. But, but leading up to that, it was the excitement and the fun of rock and roll. Yeah. Very exciting and, and very fun. And I love all the, the concert footage. It yeah. sounds really good. Yeah, it's quite a roller coaster ride. And for people that don't know Ronnie's story, I mean, he, as Sebastian said, started in the 50s, even prior to the Beatles coming on the scene <laughs> and uh, played trumpet and was in all, all different sorts of bands. And that's all covered in the film. And then, of course, the various rock and metal bands that he was a part of. So it's, it's remarkable. It really is a remarkable film. It's a very quick two hours. I wish it was even yeah. longer. Yeah. Waiting for the director's cut, Don and Demi, and wherever you are. Uh, we want to remind everybody, too, that we will take questions. So I was told to remind everybody to uh, go to the app or however you populate your questions, be sure to load them in so that we can work some in during the conversation. Um, before we get on to some other stuff, Wendy, if you can tell the audience, I mean, what is your projection? for getting this film out to people. I know that that here is part of that, obviously, right. but how do you feel about a potential timetable and when you'd like everybody to I'm thinking to in, the fall. in the fall. Um, I talked with Kathy Dawn from BMG. We've been talking very closely and things. And so we think uh, that maybe, you know, we'll get it out in the fall, hopefully. It's also at the Toronto Documentary Film Festival and I think some other festivals. So we'll see what happens, but hopefully we get it out by the fall. And we have a soundtrack coming out as well, so along with it. And one quick thing that I think is really important that was not covered in the film that I want to bring up with Wendy and that all of us have uh, went time and effort to, uh, but Wendy has done since Ronnie passed away, which is just simply amazing is the Dio Cancer Fund in Ronnie's name. Mm -hmm. And in the 11 years since we lost Ronnie, Wendy's done a bunch of different events in his name, all raised money to help those that are battling uh, cancer. Can you talk a little bit about the fund, Wendy? And Yeah, we, um, we started when Ronnie passed away. A lot of people wanted to give money to a charity and I was worried about uh, the money going into administration, which I feel a lot of the big charities do. So uh, we formed uh, with about 14 friends uh, the Ronnie James Deal Stand Up and Shout Cancer Fund. And uh, we have a celebrity bowling um, every year and we have a celebrity um, ride for Ronnie. It was a motorcycle ride and, and then bands playing and we've raised over two million dollars with, uh, with it since then. And uh, of course Sebastian and, and Giza both been bowling for us. <laughs> yes, I was brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> so I do a team, every, yeah, yeah, I do a team every year for this and uh, the first year I had uh, Geezer, he revealed to me while we were getting ready to bowl that he had never bowled before in his life prior to a few years ago. But then the next year you came with your own shoes and your own ball. You <laughs> <laughs> and Tom Morello always brings his own ball. And well, he's a pro, yeah. he's into it. But yeah. Geezer, second time in, he's got his own equipment already. So. <laughs> I had my shoes, I didn't have a ball. <laughs> <laughs> but I've heard you've made progress since. I heard you bowl quite a bit now, is that true? No. It's not true. <laughs> Twice. That's it. So we need another event so we can have Geezer Bowl a third time. Yeah, well, we hope... So we can lose. Yeah, we're hoping to do it again this November. Um, obviously, we haven't been able to do it because of COVID, but I think in November we'll do our bowling again. So yeah, hopefully. So I know that this panel is, uh, is uh, about the overall impact of this music that all of us on on this uh, stage love and have dedicated our lives to, really, and that's hard rock, heavy metal. 
and the enduring legacy of it, which when you look at Ronnie and Sebastian touched on this, I mean, Ronnie is absolutely and rightfully viewed as an icon in that space, but his origin started very differently in, mm -hmm. in, in doo-wop and trumpet or whatever he was, the, the different music he was doing. So um, I, you know, I wanna start with, you know, I'll start with Sebastian on the end. When did the metal bug bite you growing up in Canada? What was the thing that made you on, set you on this path? I think the metal bug bit me in the hotel after the gig um, and the, the sh sheets weren't very clean. No, <laughs> <laughs> a long time ago. <laughs> what was your we first exposure? We bitten by bugs, you know, what in was the your, hotel room. What was your first exposure? Well, I mean, I, I love Ronnie because of his voice. Even more than metal, just the way he sings uh, really touches me. and. I was, you know, the lead soprano in my choir when I was eight years old, and then I got into metal through the church choir. Like, that's, I was into the church before metal, but, so, you know, I got, became, you know, older and I got into it. But uh, the first time I tried out for a band, um, like in 1980, it was uh, Heaven and Hell had just come out. And um, I went to this audition, and they go, well, what song do you want to sing? And I go, do you guys know Children of the Sea? And they go, you can't fucking sing that shit. What the, <laughs> sit down. Like, what are, what are you, crazy? And I, <laughs> and I got up, and I kind of warbled through it, and I got the gig. So um, there's a line in the movie that says, um, what, what Craig Goldie says, that uh, be ashamed to die until you've passed on your knowledge. So by emulating Ronnie James Dio's vocals and Rob Halford and other guys, I, had a, I have a, a good career as a singer. So Ronnie has passed on his knowledge to other singers, and there's nobody that, that sang like him. So, I mean, it's a, a never-ending thing, but it's the sound of his voice that really, really uh, gets me. Yeah. We're gonna, by the way, we're gonna show a, a, a little clip of the film here in a second, but I just wanna finish up this, this thought. Geezer, interesting thing to ask you this question because you and your band basically created the genre known as heavy metal, Black mm -hmm. Sabbath. Mm -hmm. But when you started uh, in the first Sabbath record in 1970, with Sebast which Sebastian brought with him to have <laughs> Geezer sign, which is in his bag over there. <laughs> but, but there wasn't, what you were doing there wasn't heavy metal. When was the first time you heard the term heavy metal and how it was branded to your music and what did you think? The first time I actually heard the words heavy metal in an interview about Sabbath was uh, having a go at us. It was like um, not complimentary. It's a, it, it was a review saying the music is so heavy, it just sounds like a load of steel clanking together like heavy metal. <laughs> <laughs> it was a really bad interview. We just compared our music to a load of metal being smashed together. And um, somehow that got picked up in England and it became the term for what we were doing. How did you guys feel about it? Did you eventually kind of embrace it? Or are you like, well, call it what no, you want? No, I mean, Ozzy, for instance, hates the term heavy metal. Wow. And, um, we always thought of ourselves as a hard rock band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we were carrying on from Cream and Hendrix mm -hmm. and Zeppelin. Mm -hmm. So we were just like heavier, the next heavier step from them. Mm. And prior to it even being branded about Sabbath, it was, it was not, it was a blues more or less, right? Yeah, Polka Tolt Blues Band and then Earth Blues Band. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Did you, so you had no idea you were creating what, 50-something nope. years later would be its no. own art form. In fact, it wasn't until, I think about 10 years later, or longer than that, when uh, MTV got going, and there was a documentary about rock, and it got to, like, 1970, and, and then Sabbath came along and invented heavy metal. <laughs> and um, it was the first time I'd ever sort of heard it be in a, a good way. And Wendy, how did Ron, I mean, Ronnie was viewed as an icon in heavy metal. Even, you know, this is covered, by the way, in the film too, which Ronnie made famous, of course. How did Ronnie feel, like, because the thing I've always said, and I think I say this actually in the movie, is that Ronnie, yes, he is an icon of metal, but to me, and Sebastian touched on this, 
if you're just putting Ronnie in that box, you're selling it way short because he's got so much other ability and, and, and just range in his voice. And if you really listen to the music he made, whether it's something like Catch the Rainbow by Rainbow and the Ballads and this beautiful voice did stuff with an orchestra, the Butterfly Ball. But, but how did Ronnie feel about being viewed in that way as this iconic guy in metal specifically? I don't think he ever thought he was. He was a very humble person. Um, but he, he, I don't think he ever thought of himself as being an icon, do you think? I mean, do you think of yourself being an icon? You no. are, but, and, and you are, but when you're actually an icon, I don't think you think of yourself about it, unless, you know, sometimes people's ego get out of the way, but I don't think that, that was, he ever thought of that. He just did his job. He loved music, he loved his fans, and he just, that was all, all he ever wanted to do. But what about the genre itself, like metal in general, of him, did he did he embrace being known as a metal artist? He didn't like that term. He liked hard rock term. Yeah, yeah he didn't like heavy metal. I don't I don't know who likes heavy metal as the term. Yeah. Yeah. He's... Well, because I think to a, I think that when you talk about heavy metal, I think that there's a lot of there's a stigma attached to it. I think that also, and I don't I've said this many times. I think the problem with it is that uh, people it, it, marginalize it to a large degree. And they think that if you act, dress, look a certain way, well, then you're a metal guy, but you can't possibly be into metal unless you have the uniform, so to speak. And I know, having done this my whole life, almost 40 years in, in this business, I've met a million people that you would mm -hmm. never look in a lineup and say, that's a metal guy. Right, right. Athletes, surgeons, doctors, lawyers, pilots on planes. So. I think one of the reasons why it gets so put into a compact box and marginalized to some degree is because people don't give it enough credit for the real reach that it has. Mm -hmm. And they think yeah. that it's like, well, you've got to look a certain way. Well, you're a metal guy, but you can't possibly be into it if you aren't. I've dedicated my whole life to it and no one would pick me out of a lineup and say, look, that guy's a metal dude. So I think that's part of it a, a little bit. Um, before we go further and we work in some questions, let's take a look at the film, a clip we have from the film. Again, it's called, um, the film is called Dreamers Never Die. It's the Ronnie James Dio documentary. And if we can put that up right now, that would be great. Climb the rainbow. You're a star. We are forever, you and I. <laughs> we stars. At the time, uh, they were doing uh, We Are The World. Ronnie had wanted to be part of that, but we were nasty, heavy metal, dirty people. <laughs> we are fire and stone, and we all want to touch a rainbow. You know, often metal is marginalized and thought of as lowbrow or whatever. So many times those artists are not invited to the charity events and the charity recordings. So Ronnie decided to do his own heavy metal, We Are The World, and it was awesome. This project came about because of uh, a radiothon that the station KLOS held for two days. Our bass player, Jimmy Bain, and the guitar player, Vivian Campbell noticed the lack of people representing our genre of music, our kind of stuff. Ronnie just wanted to show that we want to we wanna help too, but do something that's a little bit different. Every single musician that made it in the 80s, you know, we grew up listening to Ronnie. So anytime Ronnie would say, listen, I need you guys, we would say, yes, we're there, because we wanted to be like him. He was a hero to all of us. You can think about anybody who was anybody on top at that time, and they were there. Do you know a lot of the people involved here today? Well, I'm meeting them out there, aren't I? I met the Ingrid Malmsteen person, you know. He's great. I like the way he puts Ingrid J. Malmsteen on his album, so you know you don't confuse him with all the other Ingrid Malmsteens in the business. <laughs> You've got all of these people. We all know about each other and what we're famous for doing and not doing. Ronnie was the captain of the ship, and he steered us through what could have been an absolute catastrophe. <laughs> Climb the rainbow! It's 
Sebastian, as a singer, when you see that and see him on mic, I just see you shaking your head. I just, the, the sound of his voice is so powerful. And he's like a little dude, right? With the biggest set of pipes, you know? And it, it's just, the sound of his voice is remarkable to me. And Wendy, you said that, uh, re and this is covered in the film, that that comes from his playing. Yeah, see, his father, um, made him uh, practice. He, he asked him one day, oh, when he was five, listen on the radio, oh, now pick him an instrument. And he just wanted to go out and play baseball. And he said, picked anything, trumpet, that's fine. And then his father took him down to the shop and made him practice like three to five hours every single day. And I think the breathing exercise from playing the trumpet made his power because he would sing from his stomach and not from his throat. Right. Geezer, what, when, when before, he, before go we go on stage, we'd say, Aren't you going to warm up, Ronnie? You go, warm up? If you have to warm up, you shouldn't be singing. <laughs> <laughs> I told that story as well. I was lucky enough to know him very well for a long time, and we would be in the uh, uh, dressing room just before a gig, and I, let me let you go so you can get ready. And you're like, what do you mean, get ready? Let's go. Let's, <laughs> you know, would, he'd walk right on stage and would be able to do that. But Geese, when he obviously, and again, this is also covered in the film, but when he comes into to Black Sabbath, I mean, the idea of replacing Ozzy Osbourne is crazy to a lot of people. Like, that's an impossible thing. Uh, and he comes in, and it becomes a whole different thing. Now, what's interesting for you is that you initially weren't going to be a part of that when Ronnie was coming in. You were not there initially when Heaven and Hell was kind of being put together. But did him coming in and you having known what he could do vocally, did that bring some appeal to you come back to the band? I was there when he came in. Um, yeah. We'd just written uh, Children of the Sea. Yeah. yeah. Um, Ozzy didn't, didn't come up with any vocals for Children of the Sea. And the first thing we played to Ronnie was what became Children of the Sea. And Ronnie just came out with straight away. He yeah. came out with like this. He didn't really not be in the band. He just had some personal problems. He went back to deal with it and then came back. Yeah. yeah. You had left, right? No, we didn't leave. Well, no, you had left to leave the record, the recording initially on, early on, right? Yeah, as it was being recorded, the right. album. And I had to go back to England, get stuff sorted out, and then I came back. And Ronnie's, you had, for people that don't know, Geezer is the lyricist of all the mm -hmm. Black Sabbath material with Ozzy. Ronnie comes into the band and suddenly there's a lyricist as well. Were you welcoming of that? Oh, yeah. I was, thank God for that. <laughs> 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 so it's just like because I, I'd written like lyrics when we first started, it was I became the lyricist in the band, and I was. It's like you know, after so many albums, you just get tired of you just get you can't rem think of things to write about. You don't want to keep doing the same old stuff. And then Ronnie came in with a t totally different uh, way of uh, looking at the lyrics, which yeah. was a great relief to me. Uh, let's get a question. We have a question up on the screen here, and uh, I don't know if it says who it's from, but the question is to Geezer and Sebastian, uh, what do you think of contemporary metal bands, especially the more extreme forms of metal, death metal, black metal, etc.? Baz, you want to start with that? Well, I, I, I like their makeup and stuff. But I don't know why all their logos look like a tree branch. They, they, <laughs> it's like, what the... F Septic flat, what the fuck does that say? Like, <laughs> shouldn't your logo like advertise your band? Like, <laughs> anyway, I'm just joking around. But uh, what, what it loses for me, death metal is the vocals. Right, me too. Like, I'm, I'm not into just screaming as hard as I can. I wanna hear some melody. And I like when Dio sang clean, like a song like Voodoo. And then, and then he'd go dirty too, obviously. But I don't, I don't hear any great singers in those bands. But I do like the theatricality of it, and you know, the corpse paint and all that stuff. <laughs> but I'm, I'm more into the the singing of a of a of a guy like Dio. Yeah. Geezer, I mean, Sabbath influenced everybody, including this this movement of bands that are the more extreme bands. What are your thoughts on it? Do you listen to any of that stuff? No. Nah. <laughs> I don't. I'd rather listen to an audio book. <laughs> but I, I do like, uh, like heavy, 
harder rock stuff like Rival Sons, mm. um, right, right. like Mastodon, you yeah. can actually hear that, what they sing about. Right. Um, all the rap. I mean, a couple of months ago, I was driving up to Utah and um, had the, uh, just put the metal station on to see what was going on. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't tell one song from another. Hmm. It was like 30 minutes and it sounded like the same song. Right. Right, yeah. So I think that there's just no um, originality anymore. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the, the, the uh, as I believe this panel is called, the enduring nature of, of metal. As I mentioned, most people, myself included, put the marker in the sand as to where this genre was started with Geezer's band Black Sabbath and the release of that first record, which was in 1970. And here we are in, uh, you know, some 52 years later, and it's still an unbelievably popular form of music. No matter how much it tries to be pushed down or uncommercial at times, it's still remarkable. I was, I live in Vegas part time and I was there a few weeks ago and I went to see Metallica who are now 40 years into their career and I watched 70,000 people fill a football stadium to see Metallica. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was incredible to actually see that all these years later, especially because I saw them when they were unknowns third build on club tours. But I think w part of that is once this music gets in your blood, it's in it for life. And uh, nobody can really put their finger, I don't think, on why that is. But Wendy, starting with you, I mean, you've been around it, you've been a part of it, you've been a fan of it, you've been a manager in it your whole life. W what do you think it is about metal and hard rock in general that really has this enduring connection to the fans? I think the fans are, a lot of the fans are people that have uh, just been discarded or something because they've worn the wrong clothes or whatever, and they take this music to themselves and they listen to it and it becomes part of them and they, it's their own music. And I'll tell you, the fans are amazing. They, they stay forever. I mean, it's still the same fans and then their generation of fans. And I think this is the first time ever that the kids listen to their parents' music. Yeah because it, it's, it was, you know, the innovators of the music. And it's a different type of music, but it, it's, it's giving you a message. And I think that's what, what the fans love as well. And, and, you know, they are so devoted, the fans. Yeah. Geezer, what do you see in that? What do you, what do you think the connection is uh, with the fans? I mean, you've been doing it, like I said, over 50 years. Where do you think it comes I from? I think because it's not shoved down your throat and it's not like a manufactured thing like pop music is these days. Um, it's sort of like a, a club that you, you're mm -hmm. in. Um, you hear p other people putting it down, so it makes you like it even more. Mm. Um, and it is like a, a, a club. It's just mm -hmm. like something that you can play in your bedroom or whatever, and uh, you don't have to listen to all the, you know, the manufactured pop crap. Do you, do you think part of it is the fact that it is always been a bit on the underground? I think that's the whole thing, yeah. Mm -hmm. That it's yeah. a bit of a, like a rallying thing, like we're a fraternity, so to speak? Yeah, I really do think it's mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Baz, what about uh, you? For me, heavy metal is a, like a rite of passage. Like, when you're a 13-year-old boy exploding with hormones, you want to party with your friends, and heavy metal is something that you go through. Like, as, as an early teen, most people that I know, every kid wants to put their fist in there to ACDC, Back in Black, Led Zeppelin, Whole Lot of Love, Black Sabbath, Dio. And I, 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 I think one thing is Sirius XM radio. I'm not just saying this because you're sitting here. But every car that is sold in America comes with Sirius XM radio, which plays metal. Mm. And I, I have kids, and I play Sabbath and Dio, and all my kids now love Sabbath and Dio. They love it, <laughs> like, because they're hearing it on the car radio. Now, now we're on the radio all the time. I mean, the, the Hair Nation station, I'm like Michael McDonald of Yacht Rock. <laughs> like, you, you can go play Yacht Rock and it's Michael McDonald every three songs. And I'm on the Hair Channel fucking every three songs. But, 
<laughs> but all, all the kids, all the kids keep getting turned on to metal. Like, it, it keeps, you know, you go to the shows and it's a dad with his kids. You know, I took my kids to Judas Priest the other night. They loved it. They absolutely loved it. So I, I think it's always going to be something that a 13-year-old boy wants to turn up real loud, get his tennis racket out, jump off his bed, play air guitar, you know. I mean, that's never going to go away, I don't think. And it keeps, I can say this for myself and certainly for Sebastian, because whenever we're together, even just this last couple of days, we revert to being those kids yeah. at 13. We're in our 50s, and we're still those kids, you know? <laughs> and it still brings that out of you, like... Uh, you know, yesterday, <laughs> not, to, not to embarrass Geezer, but yesterday we're watching the movie and, you know, Geezer's here and I'm here and Sebastian's here and we're like, yeah, we're watching a movie about Dio and Sabbath <laughs> and with Geezer and having some popcorn. I'm like, this is normal. Like, you know, we're inside, you know, we're those kids like, you know, what the yeah. fuck is happening here? But it brings that out of you. Anytime Sebastian's put out a record, uh, he has played it for me at ear splitting level and head banged in my face while he sings his own words to me. But that's what it, and I bring, I welcome that because that's what, even in our 50s, that still brings that out of you. There's well, still that energy. Yeah, well, Bobby, we also live in a time now where you get so much information, right? Like, and when we were kids in Sabbath, you know, in the 70s, when I was a little boy and you were a kid getting into metal, these guys, you couldn't buy a meet and greet ticket and meet Geezer Butler. That didn't exist. And so the mystery of a band like Black Sabbath was so mysterious. The very first time I heard the words Black Sabbath, my dad was driving a car, we went under a bridge, and someone had just spray painted the words Black Sabbath. And it scared the hell out of me. I go, Dad, <laughs> what is a Black Sabbath? <laughs> and he's like, he's like, well, you know. And <laughs> but I can't remember the question. But uh, well, no. Well, <laughs> I think at the end of the day, what I always say about it is it keeps us, it keeps you young, whether yeah. you look at it or not, oh, physically, yeah. Yeah. mentally. I mean, I, I have a lot of friends that I grew up with who aren't into this, and uh, you know, they are, they're, they're in a very different headspace in their life. And for me, I'm still like, you know. Uh, there's a Sabbath show, there's a Rival Sun show, whatever. I'm like, you know, in the front row and, hey, well, let's put you on the side. No, I got to be down front. You know, you, you, you just re revert to that. You know, Sebastian brought up something interesting in, uh, about Sirius XM Radio, which, of course, I, I do six show, live shows a week on currently. But the thing about it is, and, and that's a really valid point, is the fact that one of the things that I think is helping keep this going is that because not only do you have a metal channel on there, you have like five different hybrids right. of metal. You got hard rock, you got 80s rock, you got you know, extreme metal, you got a little bit of everything. So the availability, even though you have to be a subscriber, obviously, the availability of being able to be in your car and having that exposure, yeah. even if your kids are in the car and, uh, you know, uh, they Celtic Frost comes on, you know, it's like, there it is. It's, it's, that, it's never been in the airwaves like that. No. Commercial radio outside of specialty shows never, by and large, has touched it. And I'm curious, Wendy, for you, still being an artist manager, mm -hmm. how do you navigate where we are at now in the business and the acceptance of this music? And, you know, how, I mean, managing an artist now, I would think, is radically different than how you did it 30, oh, 35 absolutely, years ago. absolutely, absolutely. But, you know, I mean, I think it's harder now because there are so many bands and anyone can make a record anywhere. Mm -hmm. And so, and the record labels have shrunk down. There's only like four labels now. So I think it's harder to find a deal now uh, for an up and coming band than it was because there was less bands and I think there was more talent then. Now there's a, anybody can make a yeah. record and so there's a lot of crap out there, you know? Um, it's different, uh, but I do think that we, that the heavy metal, metal or hard rock as you want to call it, goes around in circles. It comes in favor and then it goes away and then it comes back again. And luckily it's back again now. And so I think we're getting another generation. The kids are now listening to it because there is nothing else coming out there because the innovators have done it all. It's hard to keep reinventing the wheel. And so they're going back and listening to the originals. Mm -hmm. yeah. Plus I think that 
a, a lot of people don't realise the musicianship that goes into metal bands. Oh, yeah. And it, it's, it's such a high uh, um, rate, the musicianship, I think. Mm. And I think people aspire to play like that. I mean, the, the drummers are in, incredible. Get incredible bass players, guitarists, yeah. vocalists, yeah. and it's such a high standard right. that, they, that they have. And um, it's sort of uh, when kids, you can't really learn anything from most pop songs if you're a guitarist or a drummer or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's all drum machines and yeah. 808s and everything. And um, so if you really want to learn, I mean, my grandkids now. Playing to all Sabbath stuff because <laughs> they're learning guitar. Mm. And their guitar teachers love Sabbath stuff and metal stuff. Um, whereas we used to listen to jazz to improve our musicianship. Kids now are listening to metal bands to improve the mm -hmm. musicianship. I got to ask you this when your grandkids are taking those lessons and trying to learn Sabbath songs, do they ever drop on the teacher? Well, my grandfather actually. <laughs> I'll just ask him how to play it because he did it. Do they drop that card? I don't know. I'm never there when they're doing it. <laughs> they should. They're very they young as do. well. They're it's really young. weird. Yeah. I went because uh, the grandkids go to Catholic school, and um, we went to the uh, their uh, parents' day and grandparents' day, and they, they did this music thing. This whole like ten year old kids were playing Iron Man <laughs> <laughs> at a Catholic school and there's me going oh. <laughs> The co creator of Black Sabbath with the witch on the cover of the first record. <laughs> But Geez, you asked me the other day when I saw you, you said, what new bands do you like? What, what are you listening to? What's good new out there? Are you, do you keep up with what's going on now? Some of the stuff, yeah. You I heard mean, anybody um, you like? Well, like I said, Mastodon are probably my favorites at the moment. Right. Um, and uh, Rival Sons, right. I think they're great musicians. Um, just things that uh, stand out as, as original rather than the same old stuff. Right, right. We have some questions that have come up on the screen, so let's work these in while we have some time. Uh, the first question I can see is, if your mother liked this music, would it have succeeded in the same way? <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I, I'm speaking for myself, I mean, my parents were pretty supportive of what I liked, and you know, I was brought up in a pretty, you know, average, uh, you know, middle class, uh, my parents both churchgoers, you know, as well, Catholic church, you know, and all that. But they didn't have a problem when I brought home Kiss Destroyer or Black Sabbath. Well, the We Sold Our Souls yeah, record. Yeah, that's pretty gnarly. When you open the gatefold of yeah. We Sold Our Souls and you've got the woman in the coffin with the cross. <laughs> that was a little, that I did get a little blowback on that one. <laughs> Just a bit. <laughs> we had the drowning of the priest. And that, right, this is covered in the film. This is this was one of the biggest takeaways of of the film for me was the fact that the cover of the iconic Dio record, Holy Diver, with the priest in the water with the chains, you'll see this in the film, but it was actually recreated. It was, yeah. To do, for the to do that. To explain, tell that story because I was I was me and Sebastian were like it's a painting, it's a painting. We couldn't figure out what was going on. Okay, so um, Ronnie and I had this idea of uh, this, this monster drowning a priest. Because the idea was from, so they, oh, I'll go back to that. So the, but neither of us could draw at all. So we had this guy, Gene Hunter, um, we're trying to tell him what we wanted. And so he went down and put the chains around him, made himself a priest, and had photos taken and came back and said, is this what you want? In a cove, like, like he actually did yeah. what, what the cover of Holy drowned. Diver actually happened. Yeah. That's but the, the cover is, is actually, it's, Ronnie's thing was, is that, you say, oh, it's a monster drowned in a priest. Bad guy, good guy. But, but just because somebody's wearing those clothes as, as a priest or you look like a monster, why are you bad or why are you good? And that's what he always used to say. Look inside the person. Don't judge it by the cover. Yeah. 
And that artist was committed to his art. Let me tell you, the guy went in freezing cold water with chains and a priest suit <laughs> to then go paint the picture of him in. That's unbelievable to me. Uh, Sebastian, your, your, your parents supportive of you and your love of the music? I mean, you got into bands extraordinarily young. How, how did that go for you? Well, my parents became supportive when I bought my mom a car. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Elvis did. You, if you're not a rock star if you're not buying people cars. <laughs> no, they, they just want, my dad was a painter and an artist and I, I just saw that he enjoyed painting so much that that's what he did for his life and I just enjoy singing. So I kind of just, you know, was followed his example. Um, but, you know. Uh, back then, it was it, we had to, we didn't have Pro Tools, we didn't have laptops. You couldn't f like sing a crappy take and fix it on the computer screen. So you had to like learn how to make this music come out of your body, and it, and it's a dying art because you know now it, too many bands you go see and and maybe the verse is live, but then the chorus comes in and it's like Bohemian Rhapsody with all the vocals going and. You know, I got no interest in that, but yeah. that's really a shame that music, like live music is like rare. You, well, you, you, have to, you can put on a t-shirt, no tapes, no fakes, all real. And people are like, wow, you guys are, you guys are really playing up there? And it's like, yeah, like, <laughs> but not yeah. a lot of bands do that anymore. It's like a dying art. It's a real hot button issue for me. Anybody that listens to me knows, and Sebastian's on board with it too, is the, 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 we're all for technology, but there's bands out there that are just blatantly faking it, whether they're lip syncing, lead vocal, right. backing vocal, guitar tracks, bass tracks, um, which uh, just, I am threatening. I don't have any musical talent. I can't sing, I can't play any instruments, but I maintain that if people are spending thousands of dollars to see artists on stage doing that, I'm starting a band. Because <laughs> apparently I don't need to write, sing, and be able to play if you can just go up there and uh, dance around to a computer, which some of these guys are doing. Mm -hmm. Geezer, I'm curious for you, starting out with Sabbath, what, how did your uh, parents feel about the music you were making? Well, they didn't have a clue what I was doing. Because <laughs> was didn't have any, because any, we were relatively poor, so we couldn't afford t tape players or anything. Mm -hmm. So uh, the first thing that they saw was the Black Sabbath cover. Oh. <laughs> and um, <laughs> on the European version, you open his gate sleeve with an inverted cross. And my dad was like, Mother of God, Mother of God. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but they were okay with it after you bought them a car too, right? They wouldn't accept anything off me. Really? Yeah. Wow. Tried to buy my house, my dad went nuts. He went, what, this house isn't good enough for you anymore. Oh, wow. So it was like, it was very uh, proud Irish Catholic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm working class. Mm -hmm. We have a question for Wendy on the screen now, and uh, I can't see who it's from, because it looks it like says, it's- says Tessa Hunt. No, Tessa, yeah, I'm just trying to see where it's from. But anyway, the question for Wendy is, uh, it's hard enough being taken seriously as a woman in music. What's it like being a woman in metal? Well, when I started in 1980, um, there wasn't really any women managers. My name was Sharon and I were the only ones. Um, it was a lot of hard work because a lot of the men did not, they kept trying to give me advice on what I should do. And I just said, oh, thank you very much and just ignored them and did what I wanted to do. <laughs> um, I think women make very good managers because they're, they have a lot of attention to detail. They can multitask, which a lot of times men, but there's a lot of women managers now. In fact, Giza has a woman manager. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, my and, wife uh, Gloria. You know, there's, uh, there, I, I mean, I think that women make really, really good managers, as I said before, because they treat them, you know, like, you know, every little detail, which a lot of times men just, uh, they don't care about that. But, you know, because musicians are, are, are very, a different breed of people. <laughs> they need to, <laughs> They do, they need to be talked to, they need, sometimes they're upset about something, silly little things, and, and men just blow it away, whereas, it's, oh, that one got more t-shirts than me. Well, you know, you just have to kind of calm them down and, and deal with it, and I think that a lot of times men don't think it's important for that certain detail, but it is. That's the trouble with having your wife managing it, you go, I'm not gonna do that. Oh, yes, you are. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. Are they talking about something in music or taking out the trash? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> music. Yeah. He's his wife, manages him, Gloria Butler. We've been friends for over 40 years, and we always like moaning about the guys. Oh, God, now what? <laughs> well, this is touched on in the Dio documentary as well, Wendy, because you, you say, I mean, obviously it's different when you're a woman who's the manager and also married to the person mm -hmm. you're managing, mm -hmm. as, as is the case now with Gloria mm -hmm. and, uh, and Geezer, but you kind of fell into it. You're, you oh, were yeah. not intending to become no, a manager. No, no, not at all. To not explain at all. that to the audience, because you, you were not, that was not what Wendy wanted to be doing. No, um, well, it was, Ronnie was obviously in Rainbow uh, when I met him, and um, his manager there was, was um, his manager was Purple's manager, and then when Ronnie was like fired from uh, Rainbow because he wouldn't write love songs, um, Ronnie said to his manager, well, you're still going to manage me, aren't you? And he said, no, I got Richie now. So Ronnie said, well, I guess you're going to manage me. I was like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's find out what's going on. Let's try it out with some new young bands. So I did. <laughs> we had Rough Cut and Alcatraz and oh, a bunch of people. And uh, I just fell into managing Ronnie. And, and you know, with, as you said, with a, with a wife or a manager, you do more things because they're going to tell you off. And they don't <laughs> care what you say. You're doing it, you know, like interviews. They hate doing interviews, but they, they know they've got to do them, but they have to be pushed into doing them. But once they're there, they're, they're fine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's grab another question here. Are there enough new bands like Mastodon and Ghost and others to build a new generation of fans? What will it take? This is a question I get asked a lot about metal in general, because people worry about uh, the, the bands that are the iconic bands, I just mentioned Metallica, 40 years into their career, they can still fill a stadium, that's wonderful. But how long can a band go like that that is uh, making music that intense? Geezer Sabbath is basically, has been done for a little while and, and you're the founding fathers, as I, as I call you. Your thoughts on that, do you feel like there's enough bands, younger bands, do you worry about as Sabbaths and Metallicas and those huge bands drop off or retire that there's enough to fill the void? I think there is, yeah. I mean, Slipknot is mm -hmm. a massive band now. Mm -hmm. uh, Ghost are doing great. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think you sort of think, oh, who's going to be next? And then suddenly somebody appears mm -hmm. and carries it on. Sebastian? Well, I think that, um, you know, we have all these sheds all over the United States of America, and there's going to be a time where, like, who's going to be playing there, <laughs> you know? Because I just I don't think that the digital recording age is lasting the test of time like the analog recording age. Like all, who here is into vinyl now? Like vinyl records, right? People are into that, right? Because the sound of the recordings of of Black Sabbath records, you know, from the '70s and the '80s, it just sounds so much better than than the way they produce music now, which is all compressed and you know, not big and grand sounding. And I think that uh, the, di the digital way of recording doesn't hit your heart the same way as the analog way of recording because it's just too perfect and computerized sounding. And the music that we love was organic and analog and just human beings making music, not computers making music. Wendy, as an artist manager, where, where do you land on that? Do you feel, are you optimistic about the future and new bands filling the void as the mega bands go away, or? I think they will, I think they will, and I think the times change too. Kids listen to different things. Uh, there's still bands coming up, Hailstorm, I love that band. I oh, think yeah. it's a, a great band, and as you said, Mastodon, and you know, and all these bands, that, yeah, there will be. And as I said, people change as well. This generation is change, it's not the same as us, it's, you know. But I do think that people have to pay their dues. They can't just be an overnight success, you know. All, everybody here has, has paid their dues, you know. You, you, it was very hard in those days because we didn't have radio, didn't have the, the TV, didn't have anything. You had to really just go out and play live all the time until yeah. you got yeah. a following. It's like when Neil Peart of Rush died. That made everybody really sad, and, and I was very sad. You know, I'm from Canada and stuff. They're like gods. It's hockey, beer, and rush in Canada. That's what they dig up there. But uh, when, he, when Neil Peart died, I was sad as a fan of Neil Peart, but I was also saying, are we ever 
on the planet Earth ever going to hear a drummer play like that because people don't put in the rehearsal time now. Yeah. They, they just want to get a program or they don't spend hours a day right. locked in their room mm -hmm. perfecting what they do. Like Neil Peart, you can't just roll out of bed and play drums like that. Mm -hmm. Like, so who knows if we'll ever see a musician of that caliber again, you know? Because yeah. of, of the hours of rehearsing. I, I think that there's great musicians and great bands. My concern about where, when it goes to the future is we, on, uh, on this stage, we all grew up with music being so important, such an event when it was released that, you know, I grew up working in a record store people lined up the night before outside the gate waiting for that gate to come open so that people could come in and buy that record and take it home. And I actually bring this up in the film. I think it's the first thing heard in the film is there's a reenactment of me speaking as, as this happens and pulling the cellophane off and seeing what fell out and smelling it and that whole connection to music, that journey, track one through track 10, looking at the liner notes, that's for younger people all gone. Mm. Uh, outside of the people like Sebastian and I who still care about vinyl or CDs, which we do, but that's gone. That's what concerns me because I have young kids and music delivery now is click 30 seconds, yeah. ah, click to the next, yeah. click to the next. There's no attention span, there's no commitment to it. Even buying concert tickets, it used to be the people that got the best seats were the ones that slept out for three days mm -hmm. and were the m most near the line to get the tickets because they had that passion. Now it's who has the most money and buys the highest VIP. So I don't worry about the bands being there, I worry about people having enough of a connection and passion for the music versus click, move, click, move. Cause that's, that's the thing that scares me. Well, I remember being a kid, you'd had a paper route, you'd save up $7, right? Over the course of a week, you'd go to the record store and you'd spend four hours picking what record you wanted. Mm -hmm. And you only got one. Mm -hmm. And so you were so invested mm -hmm. in, in Dio or, like you worked to make the money, you went to the store, you bought it now, you can press a button and get every song ever recorded by mankind for free. Like, it, just download everything. So I don't see how you're so connected like that. And Geezer, I'm interested from your perspective on this because you're somebody who was there at the beginning and recently you, you had a new band for a, a little bit called Deadland Ritual. So you tried to put something new together, get back out there again. I believe that band's kind of not happening anymore right now. But but. For a musician now, at this phase in your life and your career, is there still an appeal for you to go out there and do it? Do you even recognize the business as it is now? Um, no, because if you want to get a record deal now, you have to pay a percentage of your live music as well. Mm -hmm. like you'll get a record deal, uh, but the record companies want 20% of gross of your touring. So. You know, it's so hard to make any money and make a living out of it these days. Um, and, you know, for me to, when, when I was with Deadland Ritual, we went back to like small clubs and things. It was great band, a great up. band, yeah. yeah. But um, I just felt too old. <laughs> <laughs> just felt too old. So are you done or are you gonna still make music? I, I always make music, I, you know, my house is set up, I've got a recording studio in it, and um, just, even if it's just as a hobby, I love making music, I like picking up my bass or guitar or keyboards or whatever, and with the stuff these days, you know, the, you can make any kind of music you like, you can write whole albums, mm -hmm. not necessary to put on the market or anything, just to give yourself... Uh, uh, the pleasure of listening to what you can do. Before we go to another question, because we're getting close to the end, but I want to make sure I get some um, information in here. I've got a few notes to share, so I want to make sure this gets in, and if we have time, we'll grab another question or two before the end. Uh, staying with you, Gies, you've got uh, the first chapter of your own NFT coming out. And this will be released next Friday, March 25th, at noon Eastern time. Watch Geezer's social media for more information on that. Would you like to elaborate on that a little bit, Geez? Uh Well, it's been six months in the making. It's sort of uh, 
it's a guy from uh, this, this guy in England sent me um, a thing about uh, it's sort of like a demon taking over the world and um, I put some music to it and uh, wrote what it was about and we went on from there then he sent another one it sort of made a, a, a sort of comic out of it and um, it's going to go on wherever they do, auction next Friday. And we're going to give the money to uh, the animals, animal charity in um, Ukraine. Oh, that's mm. awesome. Great. And you were telling me uh, the other day you're close to finishing your autobiography, right? Yes, mm. I'm on about the 98th rewrite. <laughs> 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 it's like as soon as I think I've finished it, it's like, oh, I forgot that bit. And, <laughs> and so uh, it should be out uh, this sometime, year? the end of this year, yeah. Great, great. Look forward to that. Now, Wendy has, uh, for those that don't know, uh, I don't know if it's even been a year, the Dio autobiography came out. Mm -hmm. And if you can, for I know you're, uh, Wendy's going to be signing, uh, doing a signing shortly after this panel. Uh, that's going to happen at 2 p.m., and that'll be in room 10C on the third floor. So if you'd like to meet Wendy and get a signed copy of the Dio autobiography, Rainbow in the Dark, you can do so right after we wrap up. A half an hour later, Wendy will be there signing copies again, two o'clock, room 10C on the third floor, right when we wrap up. Wendy, the, the autobiography, which I thought was fantastic and was very much in Ronnie's voice throughout, the reason why that's incredible is the fact that as you reveal, Ronnie passed away midway through writing it. Yeah. Can you talk about finishing it off? Yeah, um, so he, we actually had a publishing deal before while he was still alive and he was writing it and he wrote it up to almost the end of Rainbow. And then when he passed away, um, it was like just left and then I felt that he would want it to come out. And so it took, a, you know, like 10 years to even like even think about it and go back to that place. And um, I got together with Mick Wall and um, we, I wanted it to continue in Ronnie's voice. And so we found all the different interviews he'd done and then <clears throat> I remember parts that went along with that and so that's how we finished it. So it was, uh, it was a long haul, but it was, it was uh, took me through, uh, especially the photos, you know, it, 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 there's some great photos in there. And um, it was very emotional, but I'm glad it's finished, and I think Ronnie would be proud of it. Yeah, for sure. And Sebastian, I don't. There's things you can and maybe can't talk about, but so <laughs> tell the audience what you can talk about as far as things you have coming up. Well, I might be putting out a new record. <laughs> 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 I don't know how they do all that these days, like like the nine month lead up or something. You know, like I don't know. It used to be <laughs> Used to be a lot quicker process. Did you make a new record? I don't know if I'm allowed to divulge the details. <laughs> <laughs> well, but uh, I just did a 40 city tour of America. I just got done that, and um, it was going really great until the word Omicron came on the news. So we were, you know, we ended the tour right at the right time. Yeah. So, but it feels, you know, I don't want to jinx nothing, but it kind of feels like we're kind of getting back to normal a little bit. I don't know. I don't want to. I don't want to. Until the all news up. this morning about the new variant today, but it's, I don't want to hear any about any of that. No I just want to get back to normal and um, go to shows with my friends and not worry about being six feet apart and all that, you know, because. When you're in a crowd at a metal show, it's like one person, you know, like a big throng. So I, I really miss that. Um, but hopefully the, we'll be getting back to normal. And I know we can talk about this because the guy who's doing it told me it was okay to bring up, but you are gonna be the subject of an hour long documentary yourself. A&E, yeah. Coming on A&E that's from, in production right now. From Banger Films. Yeah, so uh, keep an eye open, yeah, open for that, uh, yeah. coming soon to your TV screens. Yeah, Sebastian Bach story, ladies mm -hmm. and gentlemen. So, um, Wendy, anything you want to add? Because we have about 90 seconds here before we have to wrap it. Um, just the fact that um, people uh, have different ideas with, with, with my charity and everything. Every time I ask a musician to do something, they're always there. 
They're always there, always ready to give their love and their time and their talent. And I think people don't realize, especially with heavy metal, oh, those heavy metal Jews, they give so much time and talent to all the different charities, animal charities, cancer charities, you know, veterans, uh, and they all come and do it for you. So I think that that is, you know, that's something that they just have the warmth to do those things. Yeah, I, I got to tell you, folks, if you get a chance, get online and check out, I'll go to docancerfund.org. We spent you know, the last hour talking a lot about Ronnie, but what Wendy's done in the last 10, 11 years and this foundation she started, it's helped so many people. And uh, I've been honored to help out and be a part of the events. There's two, usually two events every year in L.A., uh, that uh, because of COVID last couple of years or so haven't been able to do. Hopefully they'll come back at the end of this year, but it's all for a wonderful cause. And it's a, it's a great way to keep Ronnie's memory and spirit alive and help people out. And even events like this, we, you know, we were saying the other day, we, none of us feel like Ronnie's gone and no. because he's still with us so much. And it's just uh, this documentary coming out, which you'll be able to see soon is a, uh, is absolutely going to keep that legacy going long when we're, you know, long gone, and I think it's great that that's out there. So everybody, keep an eye out for the film. Go see Wendy in half an hour signing the books. Keep an eye out for Geezer's NFT. Keep an eye out for Sebastian's record that he didn't make coming out soon. <laughs> <laughs> Listen for me on SiriusXM. Thank you, everybody. Yeah.